Welcome back, friends. My name's Eddie Harold. It's my Life with Breath Expert Series. And on the podcast, we talk about health, wellness, exercise, performance, organizational performance, and mental health. And today I have the great honor of having the amazing Dan Duran with me, who's been in fitness his whole career, and he's at the top of the food chain when it comes to taking care of yourself, living a higher quality of life, and staying focused on on a goal that you might have to achieve in your life. I saw Dan a couple of weeks ago at the Functional Aging Institute uh, conference in Salt Lake City, reconnecting with him. I haven't seen him for a few years. Last time I saw him was in Denver. And, uh, you know, Dan made this amazing program. This It was a, one of the keynotes. It was about good stress, bad stress, making your lifespan your play span. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. And you, you know what? You just introduced yourself as Eddie and I've only known you as Ed. And I got to say, having got to know you better over the years, you're definitely more of an Eddie to me than an Ed. So thank you, Eddie. It's an honor to be here. Hey, that program you presented at the Functional Aging Institute was spot on. What a presentation. How'd that feel? Uh, thank you. You know what felt good? Um, th there's... There's a little bit of whenever I share my background in that case, you know, talking about kind of hitting a rock bottom physically and emotionally, even spiritually, which I didn't go into. But, you know, hitting a rock bottom in my life through not taking care of myself and drinking too much, there's a bit of vulnerability that I have to share. And it's, you know, what I've learned over the last 14 years is that's what keeps me honest and keeps me humble. Um, is being able to be vulnerable and to share all those those challenges and warts, but also, you know, the, the, the story of overcoming them or at least, you know, uh, doing well with them to give hope to others. So it was a great presentation, but it, I always feel like I'm opening my kimono and kind of showing everything underneath, you know. You know, I think the universe really loves that with us being leaders in our field. You know, when we can grow from our vulnerability, I think it gives others hope. So, you know, that authenticity, people want us to be real. They don't want to see a song and dance, man. They didn't come to Vegas. They want to understand a little bit about who's the man behind the curtain. And when you think about, I was totally blown away by your story. And, and the, we'll talk about pushing human limits beyond what we would think in our mind would be doable can you explain a little bit about the discipline it took for the triathlon journey that you've been on for what's it the last 10 years yeah yeah i'm happy to uh add it's yeah i started yeah about 12 years ago um i i, I did my first i think it was a 5k now Prior to the fitness industry, I worked in fitness and training in state government and law enforcement and would have to do a five mile run. I was uh, an instructor through the FBI, so I had to do a five mile timed run once a year and mm -hmm. it beat the crap out of me. It hurt for days because that was the only time I ran. Now, fortunately, you know that it was doable for me. And then I had to do a swim test. I was a state diver, a rescue mm -hmm. diver, a specialty diver. And so I had to do the swim test every year also. And I would get sick to my stomach uh, the day before, the night of, and the morning of, because I was worried of, you know, not making it. And it just by sheer will, I passed that freaking test, both of them every year. And, uh, you know, like 12 years ago, uh, I got into the private world of training and taking better care of myself and so forth. And and start, uh, started, I started training two men, one to do a triathlon again after, I think, a 10-year hiatus, and another to do his first Ironman. Mm -hmm. And I knew nothing about endurance training. I knew about str strength, injury prevention, uh, energy systems, cardiovascular training, recovery, et cetera, but not the actual discipline. So I told him, I said, you know, guys, I don't know anything about running, biking, or swimming. You're going to have to get some help on those things, but I can definitely make you stronger longer. And uh, that ended up actually being my mantra. And I know we're on a podcast, but that's the tattoo on my arm says stronger, longer. And I adopted that mantra myself. I love it. And that. said, you know, let's what's it take to, to go the distance and beyond. And uh, 
I, I come from a uh, like a law enforcement background where we were subjected to some pretty, you know, all these different things I did, pretty mentally challenging situations. And I really loved it. Mm-hmm. I like being challenged, you know, the, no, the never quit attitude and so forth. And when I got into fitness, there really isn't that place for it. I, I wasn't getting my itch scratched. And mm-hmm. once I started learning about endurance training and going longer and longer distances, then I started getting my itch scratched again and being able to really push myself mentally and physically, uh, you know, to be able to overcome those things and get that, get that pump again. When you think about the, the time under the hood that it takes to train for an Ironman triathlon, which I believe is a two and a half mile swim, it's a 112 mile bike and a 26 point two mile run what's the you know because now you're people who don't know you're a big guy yeah <laughs> i mean you're not skin and bones no like when, like when you get a hug from dan it's taking you to the bone <laughs> so you know you might when i was a kid these guy like you would be like a clydesdale yeah oh that, yeah that's what they call these guys in these endurance races and they just had this massive endurance and they wouldn't quit. You know, what was some of the mental mindset that it took for you to get up in the morning and harness yourself in your body? Because the real part, it, it really isn't the race. It's the training. It's the journey. Right, right. Yeah, you know, I'm very goal oriented. And I think all of us uh, can benefit. And many of us already do this. But really setting a goal, and, and I'll kind of wrap up. I'll, I'll tell you my process with it, you know, before yeah. we uh, finish Take the podcast, time. because it's lessons in life as I teach my son. But it's just you have to set a goal. It can't be I want to do a triathlon someday. That's not specific enough, to, at least for me, to inspire me to get out of bed and train. Like right now, I'm training in the evenings. I'm training in the weekends. But I am not getting up at 3 or 4 in the morning to train. Mm-hmm. Because I don't have a race on the calendar. Right. If I had a race on the calendar, it'd be different. So you really have to set that goal. And then, you know, do a little mental uh, checklist of prioritization yourself. So what is it that you are telling yourself you want to do? Is it sleep longer? Mm -hmm. Is it spend more time with family? Because that's a good one. That's that's one I would say should be your priority. Is it I want to watch another episode of something on Netflix uh, is it that I just want to sit on the couch and drink more coffee for an hour before I start work? So how do your excuses stack up to your, your, uh, objectives and to your goal and just push, you know, I say press on. I learned it from Navy SEAL. I used to train with, uh, that trained me. I didn't train him. And, uh, you know, he, he, he'd say press on. And that was always his answer. Just press on, suck it up buttercup and press on. So I, I kind of took a hard, approach to doing that but you're right about those distances ed and um and i did uh, much longer distances than ironmans as well and the the and i am a big guy uh relatively speaking there's you know for triathletes so i'm right now 6'1 217 pounds all my wow. races were over 200 pounds i think the lightest i got was for my first ironman and i was just under 200 but I was probably right around 200 on race day. And my nickname on the ultra circuit is the laughing linebacker because I look like a linebacker the way I'm built. Yeah. yeah. And I, I have two objectives. One is to finish long distance races. And the other is to keep as much muscle as possible throughout the year mm-hmm. through my training, which they generally do not go together. If you want to go fast, you don't want to weigh a lot. Uh, and they call me the laughing linebacker because the more I hurt, the more I force myself to smile because we know that neurologically, you know, uh, the, the brain and the way we're wired, that if we just even force a smile where we, we find ourselves in a different place mentally. And so whenever I was in pain, I'd smile or, and, and, and they'd say this, why is this guy smiling? He's just beat the crap out of his body. Right. He's built like a linebacker. So yeah, it's sure willpower brother. You know, it's, that's it. There's no secret sauce. You just got to d- dig in and, and grind. So willpower with a smile yeah, can take yeah. you a long way. Long way, a long way. And, you know, you find your why out there on the course. And 
we're all different. So it's different for different people. Uh, it's the, the, probably the toughest race I ever did, uh, not the longest one, but the toughest one was a triple Ironman. Triple so, Ironman, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. So that was, what Here's is that? Math. Seven point something mile swim, seven, eight mile swim, uh, 300 and something. I've got a hat up here with the miles on it somewhere, but uh, 336 miles on the bike and three marathons. So whatever that is, I think it's 78 miles running or something like that. And um, you have two and a half days to complete it. And I found myself probably at my darkest moment because I only slept 20 minutes uh, throughout those two and a half days, hallucinating, I had really bad blisters. Uh, my feet, I so. And in my mind, I was running on the end of my fibia, fibula and tibia, and they were just stumps on the asphalt. Wow. And so I, I was like, I'm, I'm done. I was on the second marathon. The sun was just coming up. My son came along on his bicycle. He just woke up and said, how you doing, dad? <laughs> so, <laughs> I said, I'm not doing too good, buddy. I think I'm, I'm, I might just have to wrap it up. I don't think I'm going to finish. And his eyes got really big and he went back and he woke up my wife who had finally got down for a nap. And uh, by the time I got back to the, the area where all the people were, she just threw me in the tent, pulled off my shoes, started taping, said, there's absolutely no way you're quitting. All these, these people are out here rooting for you. And she just, right. she lit my fire and uh, I was able to finish. So you've got to, you got to find your why. You know, what is it that inspires you? And for me, in that instance, it was my wife. I could play more stories, but that's one of them. It's amazing what happens when we push up against ourselves, uh, against nature, and we begin to open ourselves up to a deeper story than what we're having right now. And as we go deeper inside ourselves, in some weird way, we reach a wall of resistance and we gradually break that wall down and we find another layer of energy, another layer of Dan or another layer of Ed. And then we'll go on for a while and we'll hit another energetic wall and the sky will start to crumble. And, you know, there's going to be all this negative self-talk and there really isn't any language that you can use, but you somehow something keeps you moving forward energetically. And then that wall, Dissolved. It's amazing how many layers we have access to when we really put all of ourself into something. Absolutely. And, you know, again, there's there's different ways of approaching this, what I call mindset or uh, resilience. You can go the really hardcore David Goggins, mm -hmm. right, Rude, if you've ever followed him or read any of his mm -hmm. books and it's, you know, uh, no excuses, no weakness, blah, you know, a very mm -hmm. militaristic, hard nosed approach. You can also go full circle and say a little bit more of like what I did. You know, why is this important to you? Mm -hmm. Find your why and keep surfacing it because there is a reason why you want to complete that event. And again, it's, that's just the triathlon world. There's, like you said, there's walls of energy. There's walls in life constantly. You have to figure out what, what is the reason that you want to uh, breakthrough, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word. I like to use a blend of the two. It's a hybrid. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I do believe that emotionally and spiritually, there has to be something driving you. But at the same time, you have to have a little bit of suck it up buttercup. If mm -hmm. it's not going to kill you, keep going. And that's the rule. Uh, when I when I do these events, I tell my wife, no matter what, unless it's a debilitating injury that will affect me the rest of my life, do not let me stop. Mm -hmm. Pain is just temporary. So no matter what, do not let me stop. And, and that's how I think we need to approach things. If it's not going to kill you, it's not going to mess you up the rest of your life. You can get through it. Just find your why and keep pressing on. You know, everybody's why is a little different. But I think underneath it all, it's all the same that we want to get to know ourselves a little bit better. Yeah. We want to feel a little more comfortable 
yeah. in our mind, a little more comfortable inside the story that we tell ourselves. We want to discard thought forms that we know we're not. We want to get out of our own way and let that deeper version of Dan or Ed come to the surface and just take over. And, and we just go for a ride, you know, for, for the average person that might be just getting out of bed one day. That yeah. might be just turning off the TV. That might be just putting the phone down. That might be saying to your doctor, you know, I don't think what you're doing is working or maybe I'm just, you know, there's so many different ways we can, really tap in that part of ourself that's really, really special. Do you have any suggestions for folks? Because you've been across many platforms, the Eastern approach, the Western approach, masterfully athletic. You're a master trainer. You train the trainers uh, of the world. Do you have any advice for people, you know, just to get on that stairway again? Well, I guess I, do you mean stairway of, Finding, you know, a, a reason to, to, to be self-inspired or a stairway into, you know, a next level fitness. And obviously, there's a little bit of both there, but um, which do you want to, uh, me to speak to, Ed? M the mental approach. Mental, yeah. So, first of all, um, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, Humility, and as tough as, you know, I used to call myself a high-speed, low-drag ninja warrior. Be polite, be professional, be prepared to kill everybody in the room. And that's how I live my life 24-7. Constant paranoia, constant high elevated cortisol levels because I was waiting for somebody to try to hurt me um, because of the mindset that I was, or what I was teaching people for years and years. So first of all, there's got to be a little bit of humility and just taking a, 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 a kind of a step back and looking at what are some of my defects of character. Now I'm sharing you with this with you because not to be, you know, respectful of the program, but I'm coming up on 14 years sober and mm -hmm. the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous are really what helped save my life. And one of those is, you know, just taking a look at what are my character defects and mm -hmm. what, do, what, what do I need to own up to? Because often, Finding those and admitting those, whether it's to yourself or to another person, can create the inspiration for you to, pre mm -hmm. to, to, to press on, to move on. So for me, much of my inspiration was understanding that, you know, I had a, 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 a high level of confidence on the exterior, mm -hmm. but a low level of confidence on my interior. Right. And so what I needed to, I, beyond admitting to myself that is I knew that the best way to build my confidence was to do things that made me uncomfortable, both physically and emotionally. So I was inspired by putting, you know, a progressively harder uh, challenges ahead of myself so that I could develop that inner confidence and realize that there's nothing I can't overcome. Mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. my deepest why. So when I'm out there training my butt off or getting tired of being blown by 30 mile an hour headwinds off the coast of Cozumel doing an Ironman and I'm, you know, mm -hmm. you're going four or five miles an hour, your bike's about to tip over because you can't go fast enough because you're 200 pounds and you're, you're like a sail out there on a bike. Right. You just say, you know what, Dan, you're, you're better than who you were. Who you were is not who you are. Mm -hmm. You're better than that. And now show up and show me that you're better than that. And that's the self-talk that got me going. And, and it, for every person, it's different. But it starts with doing a real deep self-assessment. And I think we live in a time where I think humanity needs to do this. I think we all have a responsibility to ourselves and our family to take some inventory about what's working, what's not working. What do I want to do this week? What do I want to do the rest of this year? You know, how can I be of the greatest service to everyone who's in my community? Now, you're the director of curriculum at ISM, which is the top of the food chain of <clears throat> the athletic training, fitness programming in the world. Can you give folks a little bit of a what 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 are, what are you guys working on to help us remain mentally fit, physically clear, mentally in that space? where we can't wait to take care of our body. 
Yeah, good question. So uh, I know it, it, we, we uh, see each other sporadically and my role continues to change and evolve here at ISSA. Mm -hmm. um, what I've been doing since I got here over two years ago is essentially the same, with the exception that I'm not working in the content department as much as I was for a short time. Um, my role really is making connections at a global scale and sharing education in in whatever area your you know interest may lie. So to answer your question, you know ISSA started 35 years ago, and it was co-founded by a doctor of chiropractic and a uh, doctor. Of, he had a PhD, I believe, in exercise physiology. Doctor Squat, who was the first man to squat a thousand pounds way back in the day. So we were very much a bodybuilding, powerlifting, weightlifting culture 35 years ago. Uh, and then, it, you know, over the years of evolving and adding education, we became a little more grounded in gyms versus just sports performance and athletic performance and strength and conditioning. But I got to tell you, in the last four or five years, this company is uh, a completely different company. And so I say that because we have like our playing field, if you take a hundred yard right. football field, that thing's now 500 yards long. We've got and wide. We have a lot of width and depth and breadth to our offerings. So whether it's uh, behavior change, training older adults, you and I were at the Functional Aging Institute. So right. we, we own that company and now have an entire career pathway and education uh, offering for training older adults. We have certifications and education for running and endurance sports, really well uh, put together education by Dr. Jason Karp. We have a brand new Yoga 200 uh, certification, 200 hour course that's uh, Yoga Alliance accredited for the folks that want to pursue that type of that. We have a, a health coaching channel that's just absolutely blowing up right now through education and certification, which I, I think really maps to what we're talking about here. So what is it you want to do? Do you want to train athletes? Do you want to train kids? Do you want to train older adults? Do you want to uh, help people with nutrition? Do you want to help them get stronger? Do you want corrective exercise? Do you want to help them with recovery? We have a specialization for that. You name it, we have it. And so our objective is to really provide a, a, you know, an, an unlimited offering of continuing education or uh, base level certification for anybody that wants to enter into that field of helping others. I'm not going to say personal training, serving others, helping others, mind and body, wellness, right. Right. not just funds and guns. I love it. So when, when I started out in the athletic world in the 70s, you know, there was a lot of dumbbells and you know bench press and shoulder press and you know then there was cardio and then uh you know the women did yoga or the, maybe they did meditation the guys wouldn't do that and we can see you know this whole no pain no gain thing just show up and crush it yeah might not be the best thing for us in 2023 can you can you explain explain a little bit about you know, how you're approaching the wellness, the wholeness, the training, how, how everything is, has kind of morphed into something different in the last 60, 50 years or so. Yeah, well, you're absolutely spot on, uh, Ed, and no doubt we see, and it'll continue to evolve, right? We're going to continue to see, I call it the pendulum swinging, mm -hmm. because although there's a lot of evolution and certainly in technology and now with artificial intelligence and so forth, we're still, we still see a pendulum swing back and forth between traditional strength training and very functional, weird, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean, you just look at it and go, what are they doing? And what is right. that piece of equipment? Right. So right now, the pendulum is actually starting to swing slightly back into traditional strength training. So gyms are clearing out treadmills and putting in uh, full racks and half racks for Olympic weightlifting because that's starting to make a comeback. Um, I, I, I know exactly what you mean by the yoga, the cycling, the Pilates, mm -hmm. uh, group exercise. That's the ladies. You know, if you want to grunt and drop your weights on the ground and bench press, that's the dudes. And mm -hmm. you, you kind of had your place. I was one person that learned, uh, thank God, from my peers, uh, just how beneficial all those modalities are. 
And by the time I left the, the gym world and went into the education world, I was doing Pilates, I was doing yoga, I was doing uh, correct, uh, group X, I was teaching uh, Pilates movements. Same thing with cycling, is having that much more well-rounded approach right. because the body loves variety. That's, yeah. that's how we were designed to move. We yeah. weren't designed, and I know we're on a podcast here, but if y'all are listening and just put your hands at your sides like you're gonna do a bench press, Mm -hmm. And you, you push your arms out, right? Your hands are going straight in front of you. Well, then you do a dumbbell press. Okay. Mm -hmm. And now we do a cable chest press. Okay. And now we do a machine press. Okay. Now we do a push up. Okay. And this was me for 20 years saying, no, I keep mixing up my exit, my, my workouts. Right. No, you're not, right. man. You're just mixing up what you're using to do that exact same movement. So we need to be more aware of the importance of three dimensional movement more aware of the importance of the endocrine system, the autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. and recovery to really get the most out. Otherwise you will be paying the price with shoulders and knees and hips from just lifting weights later in life. I love the education portion of what you guys put out there. Uh, we're just coming out of this jab thing and quarantine and you know, the, the jab's going to save you and you'll be fine and shut down the gyms and, you know, everything's going to be fine in two weeks. Really, really disappointing at, at kind of the umbrella federal level of how this thing was handled, kind of turning off the body's natural healing system, the body's natural immune system, you know, getting out in sunlight. <clears throat> how can we educate people, number one, about the importance of the body's a self-healing mechanism and it's designed to keep you healthy and there is no substitute for movement. There is no substitute for concentration. There is no substitute for good nutrition. There is no substitute for a good night's sleep. And how can we teach folks that this should be part of our culture? Boy, that's the million dollar question, Ed. And it, I, and I'll, I'll tell you that what you're doing right now, is really what we're what we have to do and that is to educate in many modalities mm -hmm. we have the podcast listeners so full disclosure i've, I've never listened to an educational podcast ever mm -hmm. because uh, my modality is reading mm -hmm. i don't like watching videos that are educational mm -hmm. i'm mm -hmm. a voracious reader my Great. son is huge with videos 4.0 student but hates to read mm -hmm. so we need to have education and outreach in as many modalities as possible so that the different types of learners can, you know, ingest this information. But at the very basic level, and, and I, you know, whether you believe in creation or, you know, uh, 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 or in evolution, and I'll keep that to myself because I don't want to, you know, get anybody freaked out here, but regardless, we go back a long ways, right? Let's just agree on that, like thousands right. of years. This body was created or evolved, designed to operate in a certain way. The first is to move all the time, to sleep and wake with the sun, right? right? So we have a circadian rhythm. Mm -hmm. We ate only whole foods or natural foods. We didn't have, you know, high fructose corn syrup and MSG and all this other nasty crap that we're putting into our bodies and plastic and you name it, the list goes on and on. So why don't we just start with that and go, huh, what were the bodies, of, you know, created or evolved? How were they, you know, created to operate? And are mm -hmm. we operating it in that same way? The answer is an emphatic no, mm -hmm. we're not, we're not moving. Then beyond that goes education. And again, be careful what you read, be careful, you know, that social media is not the place to get your PhD. Let me tell you folks, uh, you need to listen to folks that, who have been in the industry for years or experts like Ed here. Uh, and what I would submit to you is folks that maybe learn some of those lessons the hard way, because that's where I come from. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but boy, have I made a lot of mistakes. And I yeah. like to think that every one that I've experienced and overcome was by leaning on somebody smarter than myself and learning the why behind the what. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Stay curious, as my friend Michelle Dalcor would say, and then spread the message. Probably the most impactful thing we can do. And I'm looking at this at not all of us have children. Mm -hmm. Not all of us want children. I totally respect that. But a heck of a lot of us do. 
it's educating the next generation. It's educating your kids or the, the folks that you have the opportunity because if we can't pass down that generational knowledge, all we're going to have is what's out there in marketing. And there's right. billions of dollars put into marketing and telling you what you should eat, what you should drink, what you, pill you should pop and what you should do. That's not necessarily the answer, but boy, do they have a lot of money behind them. Yeah, we are really in a little war for our heart and soul, for our mind. You, know, you must see a lot of what I see uh, since the quarantine, which three things I see predominantly. Number one is I see anxiety. I see unfounded nervousness. And I see a lot of people who can't sleep. And it's an epidemic throughout America. You could just go out in the public and you're, you're going to be, where's the humans? Uh, how I like to approach this temporary market that we have in time, number one is connection. We need to make connection. Number two, we need to communicate. And number three, we need to adapt. You provide folks an amazing service at ISSA. The connection, the communication, the adaptation. How does fitness training and athletics help the mind help us get beyond this unfounded nervousness, this constant state of anxiety, and this mental state of I can't sleep anymore? Yeah, no, that's, that is a really good question. And at the risk of sounding uh, too excited about it, but I think most would agree, exercise is medicine, folks. So yes. Is food. So is food. Okay. Food and exercise, they are medicine. Now, I am not, I do not have degrees in uh, neurology or psychiatry or the brain or anything like that. So when I speak to, to, what I'm going to speak to, I'm going to do it from a very high level. And that is that the effect that movement and exercise has on the brain because of the, the hormones and the chemicals release, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, mm -hmm. oxytocin. Mm -hmm. Those are the, you know, they all have different roles in right. our behavior. Dopamine and uh, endorphins are more like that kick, that, that, that mm -hmm. pump, the, the, the satisfaction. And then serotonin and oxytocin are more like feel good hormones. And they're all encouraged through movement. They're all encouraged. And I just say movement because exercise, mo all movement is exercise. People think I got to get on a treadmill. I got to get on a spin bike. I, I got to pick up a dumbbell. No, you don't. You just need to move, folks. Take mm -hmm. a couple laps around the block. Go walk your dog. Pull some mm -hmm. weeds in your yard. Mm -hmm. It's just movement. Movement is medicine. And you end up stimulating the same receptors in the brain through exercise that you do through drug use, alcohol mm -hmm. abuse, uh, you know, pick your fancy, whatever it is that, 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 you know, there's plenty of other addictions and there's plenty of other bad behaviors, uh, eating a lot of sugar, food addictions, the same receptors in the brain are stimulated through exercise. Exercise saved my life. That's, that's right. why I went the distance in, you know, the ultra world and haven't touched alcohol in 14 years. It's because it has that same stimulatory effect on the brain. It is medicine. It, it's like you, you, you don't have to, to, to go in with both feet and say, I'm going to go join a gym. Little tiny incremental steps right. in moving more and eating just a little bit better, sleeping a little bit more. If, if, you know, if you're already getting 12 hours sleep, uh, that's, that's different. But, and, and hydrating a little bit more, those little incremental steps are huge. I, I'll tell you that story. I, just after, as the, I don't know if there isn't an end to, to pandemic. Okay, so beginning and end. I don't, we don't have a hard date because, to your point, there are a lot of, a lot of folks out there pretty scared still. And uh, I think you know we we have the opportunity to see them at times or hear from them at times, and that creates a whole lot of anxiety. My good friend, my ultra triathlon mentor, who by the way has done thirty Ironmans in thirty days, uh, he is a financial planner. I think he's done it more than once. He's written several books, but he's actually by trade. He's a financial planner. That's how you can afford to go exercise for 30 days, folks. Uh, become go. a financial planner and an accountant and own a couple of businesses. But he and I were on a call and he said, Dan, 
my psychiatry folks, you know, the folks that are doing mm -hmm. uh, therapy now because of the, 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 the rise in uh, Teladoc, you know, right They're they're counseling mm -hmm. over a Zoom call. Yeah. They're, they, they can't find enough ways to stash their money. Mm -hmm. It's like they're rolling in it. I'm working overtime just trying to find ways so that they don't have to pay so many taxes mm -hmm. on all this money they're making. The point being, we were very unhealthy mentally and a mm -hmm. lot of folks needed help. And you know, good on them that we have folks out there servicing them and making a great income doing it. But exercise can be a great way to help with that. I'm, I'm not providing therapy or, or giving instruction. There are certainly things that we need to see professionals about, but at, but at the very least, get out and move more, get some sun, get some sleep, drink some water, quit putting crap in your face, uh, and you will feel better. I guarantee you that. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, for a myriad of different reasons, I wasn't interested in typical schooling, K through eight, high school, college. I went to my body to learn about life. I went to movement to understand risk, reward, good choice, bad choice. My body was where I went to in a myriad of anything you could do during the day to exercise, surfing, running, swimming, uh, sailing, uh, football, baseball, basketball, weights, cardio. That My body was my MIT. It, it was hard. It was, I, under, I understood kinesiology. I understood my body told a story. And I was part of that story. And I wanted to be a good steward to that story. For I, I struggled with memorization. I struggled with repetition and, and, and I mean, I knew that, you know, the 12 times 12 timetables and, you know, the basic stuff, but I really felt like I didn't fit in, in the world in traditional education. And, and I, I went to build confidence and understand life risk and reward through competitive sports. And, and that, that's where I, you know, I failed, you know, many, many more times than I succeeded in, in the competitive world. But I always gave a hundred. I gave everything I had because that's all my parents told me to do with, with whatever you do in your life. So, you know, I think it's never been easier under these high stressful situations to start to make little in inroads into moving your body, controlling your breath, working up against your environment, getting to know yourself a little. You don't have. So the people that might not have the greatest mental acumen in the brain can use their body to start to understand themselves and understand the world that we live in. I love that. Um, and, and I never, I personally have never thought of it that way or looked at it that way. But as you were describing it, I, I definitely saw a lot of that in me. Um, you know, my evolution as an instructor, it started with working for the state. I worked for the state of California for 22 years. And uh, most of that was in law enforcement. And then uh, the most of that was in training. So once I left the field, uh, I was a trainer and I ran our police academy and I taught at other academies. But what I taught was anything physical. Mm -hmm. I did not teach hazardous material res res or response or, you know, criminal mm -hmm. studies or it was uh, anything having to do self-defense, firearms, impact weapons, use of force, high-speed driving, um, anything that involved movement, physical fitness, because that's how I felt like I could express myself best. And I always got feedback. And especially in the world of, of self-defense and like that martial arts world, um, it's, it's, you truly get to know what your body can and cannot do. I used to say, the more I understand the way the body moves, Mm -hmm. the better I understand how the body won't move. So mm -hmm. for submission holds and joint locks or any of that stuff. Now, I know that's not what we're talking about here today, but I mm -hmm. feel like I spent many, many years in fact, just infatuated with mm -hmm. understanding how the body moved and how much I could get out of what I have. How much can I get out of this body? Not only in output, but in longevity. Now, back then I didn't care about output. I would have done things or longevity or I'd have done things mm -hmm. differently. But it's absolutely our connection. Now, not everybody, you know, some folks come into either come into this world with um, 
uh, what do you call it? Like congenital issues mm -hmm. where maybe they don't, they, 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 they could have issues with uh, appendages or with MS or something that happens later in life that completely different in, in the aspect of what I'm, I'm framing up here, but we still, we're still humans. And we, we still have a body, we still have skin and bones, we still have our mind. And if we're not exercising all of them, what we have available to us, we're setting ourselves back. We're not evolving, we're not getting stronger, we're not super compensating. So whatever it is that you have, make sure that you're using it. If you're not evolving, you're dying. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that stands in everything. And that's the way the that's life. just the way the planet works. Speak about you know talk about evolving. Here's something we don't hear a lot about: the genius of our soft tissue, our fascia, the human myofascial tissue. It's intelligent. It holds memory. We move it all the time. It makes us feel good, but we don't talk a lot about it. Can you share with folks a little bit about our soft tissue and how genius it is? You know, I my I would. Definitely defer to folks out there uh, like Dr. Thomas Myers, who wrote the book Anatomy Trains. If you want to learn more about uh, connective tissue and fascia, you want to look at those books. My mentor, one of my many mentors, Michelle Dalcourt, mm -hmm. who speaks a lot about this. Another of my men, two of my mentors, Rodney Korn and Ian O'Dwyer, who literally yes. have created a company around uh, connective tissue and fascia and, and mobilizing it. Because I, I, So I will butcher it if I try to interpret it. But what I will say is you are absolutely right. And not only that, but we have, you know, uh, energy stored within our abdomen. Mm -hmm. we, we like to think that this between our ears is our brain, but mm -hmm. we have an emotional center at the center of our body. And I believe you teach that, Ed, through your yoga practices and so forth in a whole different way. But it's not just what's between our ears, folks. And it extends to our entire body through stimulation. So, uh, you know, connective tissue and fascia is, again, meant to be mobilized. It's meant to be utilized. It's, it's, it, it requires friction. It actually requires movement and friction mm -hmm. to yeah, hydrate. Yeah. And if you don't hydrate mm -hmm. uh, the connective tissue, you set yourself up for injury. You store metabolites and toxins. You, uh, you cannot uh, store and transfer, you know, uh, receive, store, and re release force as effectively you set yourself up for injury i i remember when i first started teaching uh these weight loss classes and i had a whole section on the architecture of your body and mm -hmm. so being the connective tissue and then the bones and how they work together for mm -hmm. something called tensegrity right uh, tensional integrity mm -hmm. so the tissues the connective tissues the tendons the muscles they they pull the bones together or they create space between them and they have to work together in synergy for the to create this freestanding structure and on the topic of hydration, if you're not moving, you could drink, in theory, two gallons of water a day, but you're not moving, your tissues will dehydrate. Amazing. It's, it's just like blood where you have to contract muscles, right? Because veins have little valves in them, then the blood only flows one direction. And so when you contract muscles, that's what encourages that venous flow back to the heart. The same thing with tissue and hydration. If you're not moving it, expanding it, contracting it, uh, rubbing on it, having friction on it, some type of movement, it will dehydrate regardless of the amount of water that you drink. It's so helpful, folks, to understand that we need to move these bodies. It's that simple. And the end of story. You know, in my world, I'm getting a little older. I'm up in my mid-60s now. One thing I noticed in my training is that I've lost some of my core strength. I've lost some of my connection to my lower abdomen. Uh, do you have any tips out there for folks who might be going through that transition where you, where you don't seem to have that same connection you had to your lower body mechanics? You don't seem to have access to that core fire like, like you used to? You know, I'm going to come back to how were we designed to move. Right. And if you consider, let's just core being, you know, picture uh, like the, the bark around a tree, right? Mm -hmm. It's all the muscles around the trunk. It's not just your abs. People think core, they right. think abs, right? So 
it's all the inner muscles up to and including the diaphragm. And then it's uh, your glutes are a part of that stability as well as the, the, the muscles alongside your spine, you know, like the rectus mm -hmm. spinae because they're stabilizing you. Right. What is the purpose of those muscles? Well, the purpose is not for sit-ups. <laughs> okay. It's not to be in a, a supine position on your back and then bring your knees up and bring your head up. Like we've been taught for ever to train our abdominals. That's not what they're actually designed for. They're designed to transfer energy from your upper body to your lower body and vice versa. So picture yourself pushing on a refrigerator to try to get it into place. You're transferring energy through your body, your feet are grounded, and it's kind of a closed chain and I'm now pushing that refrigerator or I'm pulling that refrigerator or I'm carrying a suitcase. I'm mm -hmm. transferring energy between my hands and feet in its simplest sense. So my suggestion is get back to or do more types of training where you're integrating your hands and your feet. Don't try to isolate muscles mm -hmm. by doing B-ups and crunches. And those, it's not that they're a bad thing. Leg raises. I mean, there's a bazillion ab exercises and glute exercise out there. But if you're isolating them, that's not actually how they operate in the body. And so the brain, Amazing. the brain is way smarter, you know, wow. uh, autonomically, automatically, then you are telling a muscle what to do. So if you just tell the, the body, I need to push on this thing with my feet on the ground, it knows which muscles to activate. It knows which muscles are needed. So do more total body type movements, integrating your hands and feet or your upper and lower body in as many different planes and as much variety as possible. And that includes doing things that are not unilateral. In other words, I'm going to use a very uh, simple uh, example here is a farmer's carry, right? So a farmer's carry is usually kettlebells, dumbbells, some kind of weight in your hand and you're walking. They call mm -hmm. it a farmer's carry. And I think it kind of has to do with maybe carrying a couple of five gallon buckets of something, right. whether it's slop or water or food, I don't know, but it's a farmer's carry. But consider this in life. How often do you carry things with both hands that weigh exactly the same amount on each yeah. side? Right. Show me when you carry two suitcases and they both weighed exactly the same amount within a pound. Show me a woman that carries a purse on each shoulder. Show me a person that carries groceries, the equal amount on each side of their body. It just doesn't happen yet. We train our bodies that way. So the minute we step outside of that, that space that we've been training ourselves, for example, carrying groceries or a farmer carry, I'm just compressing the spine, but I'm not using a lot of the lateral muscles on my body because the weight is equal. So do more unilateral training or mm -hmm. offset weight training to replicate the things that we actually do in life, like carry only one suitcase in one hand. What are you doing in the gym to prepare you for the sport of life? Right. That was just so well said. You're amazing. Like what a wealth of knowledge. I learned it all from my mentors, Eddie. I, I, I am, I'm telling you, man, you know, the old saying, if you're the smartest guy or gal in the room, you're in the wrong room. So I found myself in the right room. A lot of times you just pay yeah. attention. That was just so great. You know, I'm a, I'm a big breath guy. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big visual learner. I like to visualize, you know, I, I love, I'm a big skeletal muscle guy. Uh, I like force from the foundation. I like force from the earth skeletal muscles, controlled breathing, visualization of skeletal muscles. Can you explain a little bit the difference of the physiology of the skeletal muscles against movement and the superficial muscles that we see in the mirror? Yeah. So if I'm understanding you correctly, so all what muscles do is they move joints, right? Okay. A muscle's job period is to move a joint as an origin, as an insertion, and it's to move this point or joint. Some are extremely important. They're all important, but some are extremely important. Uh, the ones that, and, that, and some of them actually are like the diaphragm is not necessarily moving a joint, but it's moving the rib cage in, right. in and out. So it's moving bones, which have joints along the, uh, the spine. So we have the ones that we see in the mirror, like the pipeline, you know, because of the biceps, Brachy and brachialis, you know, we want to see that line. We want to see those veins in the forearms because of the Radi what is it? Biceps brachioradialis, right? We got quads. We, 
It's that stuff in the mirror. But what we really need to be able to do is move the joints effectively. Mm -hmm. So when we think of, of, of skeletal muscles, we have the axial skeleton, right? Everything kind of in the center and the appendicular skeleton. So what is it that I need to be able to move that entire skeleton and move those bones in my body efficiently and effectively? So here's a great example. This is one I used to, I've used many times with folks when I, especially when I got into personal training. Mm -hmm. um, I, if you go back and look at old photographs of some of the, uh, it was primarily men that built the railroads across the United States. Uh, it was primarily, uh, I, a lot of them were Asian, uh, I think immigrants and so forth, but they were very slight people mm -hmm. with very small muscles, mm -hmm. but they were swinging sledgehammers all day long. Mm. Now you can take the big yoke, dude, and I'll throw myself in there 10 years ago and give me a sledgehammer and ask me to swing that thing all day long and it's not happening. Mm -hmm. I might last an hour. Mm -hmm. Some people call that functional strength. Okay, mm -hmm. call it what you want, but the ability to move effect effectively and efficiently is not linked to what your body looks like in the mirror. Mm -hmm. It's how you train it, how you recover it, and what the, the forces are that you subject it to so that it can super compensate and get stronger or more adapted to whatever movement you're doing. So train for the sport of movement, train for the sport of life first. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to look good, that's a different set of training principles or not principles, but uh, uh, programs. Well, everything's an inside job, <laughs> you know, and we're all in sales, you know, we're all inside choosing all the time, how we're showing up in the present moment. And, you know, I just want everybody to know how lucky we are to have someone like you out there in the fitness world, because the fitness industry itself has never been better. And you're one of the reasons why, Dan. And I just can't thank you enough for sharing your wisdom, knowledge and heartfelt message about our life and the opportunities that we have. Thank you, Dan. Yeah, it's my pleasure, Ed. And, you know, a couple of parting thoughts. Uh, first of all, you only have one, you know, shell. Uh, again, depending on your beliefs, the, the, the scripture of the Bible says that we need to care for our temple. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you if you come from a different school of thought, this is all you got, folks. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is all you got. So take care of it and understand that everything you do and eat or ingest either helps or hurts. What you're, what you're hoping to use for the next God knows how many years, right? Our mm -hmm. lifespan, we, we technically can live to 122 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's grandmother passed recently at 97. Uh, yeah. We can live a long time, but it's going to depend on what you do with it. So there's that. So, you know, pay attention, get connected, build community, have friends, move well, eat well, sleep well, and hydrate. But the last parting thought I wanted to leave at the end, and I mentioned this earlier, and this kind of ties back to the mindset thing. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I, when I started doing these ultra races, uh, yeah, but I, in other words, anything beyond an Ironman, when I really started getting weird with it, um, I really hoped to, to, that my son, who was very young when I started him, that he would get some lessons out of it. He went to every one of the races and my wife, he and my wife were my crew member, they, my crew. They gave me my food, wrapped my feet, changed my shoes and all that stuff. And I said this many years ago, and every year it's become increasingly important to me to be able to share with him and to share with others. And it's just these really simple steps. And here's the thing. Anything, anything is possible. Okay, Anything is possible. If you set a goal, remember I mentioned earlier, Mm -hmm. Do I have a race? Do I have an event? Do I have it? It doesn't have to be competition, but do I have I set a goal that I want to achieve with a date? Mm -hmm. Then I need to make a plan. How am I going to achieve that goal? Mm -hmm. And then I need to follow that plan. I might need help creating that plan. Follow it. But remember, things never go as planned. Mm -hmm. So be willing to adapt, change, tweak, but still always have a plan. Most importantly, ask for help. Ask for help from others, whether it's coaches, mentors, loved ones, family members, ask for help. And when they give it to you after you've asked for it, freaking listen to them. 
That's the that that's definitely the conundrum we often find ourselves in, and I've been guilty of. If you've asked for your help, somebody's help, shut up and listen and do what they tell you to do. If you do those things, you set your goal, you have a plan, you ask for help, you listen to the others, all you have to do is make sure that you never give up. Flat out, end of sentence, press on and never give up. Words to live by, ladies and gentlemen. And Dan's living proof that it works. And he hasn't even had his best days yet. So what's Still behind coming. him is superhuman. What's in front of him is supernatural. If you ever get a chance to meet Dan at one of the conferences around the world that he teaches, you'll get around him and something inside you will turn on magnetically and you will want to be better. You won't want to do better. You will want to be better. And that's one of the great things that you get when you get around Dan Duran. You will be a better human being if you get around his energy and he looks you in the eye and you know it's game time thanks so much dan i appreciate your time today you're very uh kind sharing this hour with everyone it's been my honor and you have the same effect ed ah, thank you buddy effect you're a great man and listeners out there thank you for this opportunity uh tune in to ed more because he truly is a unique individual that always makes you want to be better Thank you so much, brother. I appreciate you so much. Right back at you.